Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I'm your co-host, along with Jamie Bateman. And today, we've brought on a special guest, uh, someone pretty much everybody in the note industry knows, or if you don't know, then somebody you should definitely find more information about, and that is uh, Mr. Dave Van Horn with PPR. And Dave, how are you today? Great, gentlemen. How are you doing? Good, good. Doing well. So... We are on after a quick Zoom snafu, but uh, we got things up and running and so forth. And uh, for today, um, you know, uh, with Dave, we wanted to kind of talk about uh, PPR, how he got started in the space, and some also definitely some of the exciting things that he has uh, coming down the pipeline as there's been um, some, you know, uh, an interesting, I'll say, uh, I want to call it a shift, but some partnerships Dave's gotten involved in and uh, people can learn about because it's also opportunities, I think, for everybody listening out here today uh, for some potential opportunities as well. But we get started. Uh, Dave, do you want to give people a little bit more about your background? About my background. Um, I'm from Philadelphia area. Start there, I guess. Um, and I guess uh, I started pretty much as a uh, contractor and uh Worked in construction, uh, went to college at first as an accounting major, but switched to management, got done, couldn't get a job, imagine that, and uh, went into construction and stayed there a while. And then, believe it or not, I was in it for 22 years, actually. And I had my own company for 10 of those 22 years. And uh, my oldest son still runs that company, uh, Van Horn Painting, which is a commercial contractor. And uh, but I was also a realtor since age 26 and uh, you know, later got into fix and flips and was a property manager and owned a title company and you know, worked at a bunch of different, uh, you know, I was looking, I've been an agent over 30 years. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, actually uh, started buying properties in 1989, uh, my first rental. And I'm actually selling that rental right now. I'm, I'm selling 14 properties to uh actually a guy i know from like bigger pockets and things like that <laughs> who's local is a guy that we would meet for like lunch and breakfast type stuff and the good guy and he's more in accumulation mode you know i'm more in preservation mode and mm -hmm. um it's just a good time to sell right now for me um mm -hmm. with uh at one point i had like 40 places so i've been uh slowly but surely right before the last downturn i actually got down to about 20 properties um so i had unloaded just before the crash it was kind of neat i unloaded a good third of my portfolio mm -hmm. and uh and looking back i was like i should have unloaded the whole thing probably <laughs> but the uh i wasn't that smart mm -hmm. um but i did get rid of ones i was looking to get rid of you know that kind of thing and uh and kind of doing it again it, and it's not that it's a you know, like the buyer's getting a bad deal or not. Actually, his financing so freaking cheap. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not, not, he's probably cash flowing better than I am. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, but, but it is a good time to sell. I, I do believe it's a seller's market. I sell, you know, I oversee our REOs uh, and I probably sell, you know, a few hundred houses a year throughout the country uh, mm -hmm. through our loss mitigation stuff. And because uh, I have a, like an REO asset manager in house and uh, Amy, she's amazing. She could, you could go, here's a hundred properties. Can you sell these? And she'd be like, okay. You know, like, <laughs> whereas a typical realtor would lose their mind if you uh, said, here's a thousand listings. So, I was, so uh, sorry to cut you off. I, I think next time we can start with what you, what you haven't done. It'd be yeah, easier. there you go. It's a shorter um, lesson. <laughs> but uh, I was, how about the note space in particular? How did you get, get in it? To that space well yeah it's kind of leading up to that so yes. at one, one point i um used to run a real estate investment group it literally started out with 12 people at lunch and it in a five six year period it ended up being in five states and six cities from baltimore to new york and we had eight thousand people in our database in that that period of time and i used to interview the speakers and then uh, one of the speakers was a guy out of new york who was raising capital for pools of distressed junior liens um, and that's kind of, uh, how it started. And I really didn't do anything for the first probably two or three years. And, but my partner did, my partner, John invested some and we're like, you know, how are you be able to pay these kinds of returns? 
And um, what ended up happening was right before the crash, uh, my partner was, he was one of my lenders. He was a investor friendly mortgage guy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we kind of saw the writing on the wall. I was at a Remax at the time. I was probably selling about 75 houses a year. And I, I went down to selling about seven houses a year. <laughs> so Ouch. it was, it was a good time to adjust. And I was fortunate. I had enough rental properties. I could live off my rentals. Like I didn't have to work. I was about 40, I guess I was about 42 at the time. I, I was 42 when I left my uh, contracting business. So I guess it was right after that. I kind of went to desk work cause I had hurt my back. And, um, and then started, you know, started doing my own rentals and things like that and becoming an investor friendly realtor. And then that led into the note business. But when I was running that group, I was also raising money for commercial real estate. I was doing mobile home parks, uh, mostly in the Midwest. We were in Indiana, Michigan, and we were doing uh, mobile home parks and storage. And then uh, also had done some commercial office condo construction. So I was fundraising for that kind of stuff. And uh, that's when I got approached by my partner. Hey, why don't you raise money for notes? And that's kind of how we teamed up. And he was kind of working through the assets. And then later on, I was an asset manager as well for a little while. And, and then my other partner, Bob, he had kind of oversaw most of the asset management uh, for those loans at that time. And then you know, we, we were, to be honest with you, we were pretty much a club. You know, we started out with our own money and we kind of started raising money from other people. And then we started you know, doing regular private placements. And then, you know, so it was, it was like a club, then it became a, you know, a little more of a business. And then, you know, now it's kind of a, an enduring enterprise kind of thing. It's a, uh, it's a little big club right now. I'd have it's to a say. bigger club. Yeah. <laughs> and we do. And the funny thing is uh, we've also morphed a few times and changed some of our models and um, we do more first liens, well, more capital in the first liens, put it that way. Mm -hmm. Then we do junior liens and then, uh, and then we have some other channels now and we have some JV partnerships. So it's uh, kind of expanded the business. And when I first started in notes, I think that's what you asked. And I probably answered a different question, but when I first started in notes was really in seller financed. It was like the um, Jimmy Napier, Donna Bauer, Pete Fortunato type stuff. And I was doing seller finance notes. Like if I sold a property to a buddy, I would hold a second. So, you know, he can come in and take the keys, cash flow with no money down, all that kind of stuff, all the creative financing stuff. And, and then I, I was also doing private or hard money. Uh, I was doing that for, you know, I was had friends, financial friends that would lend me money to do my fix and flips. And I would lend people uh, money from my qualified plans or from my, lines of credit. And at one point, you know, I started buying houses with credit cards and I'd fix them up with a credit card, move a tenant in, refinance, pay the credit cards off. This was back when credit cards were great with very low fees, no <laughs> cash advance fees. It was like free money. Um, I did that for a long time and built up a pretty decent sized portfolio. And then of course the market jumped up and I had a lot of equity in my, you know, a couple million in equity. And I started putting lines of credit on my properties and then I became a lender. So Today, I really only invest in three things, uh, anything uh, insurance related, because I had an insurance license, anything real estate related, or anything uh, lending related. That's really the, the box I play in for personal investments, you know. And right now, you know, for people listening, you know, you've grown it now to about $150 million, I think. Plus yeah, we just, we've just passed $160 million under management. Yeah. Um, but we're growing pretty rapidly, especially, you know, we had, we've been working on a JV partnership with AMIP, mm -hmm. uh, which is on the, they're on the West coast. They're in Orange County and they're about 10, 12 times bigger than us. And um, we've probably been working for the last year on that. And uh, right now we're trying to get an MRA, which is a line of credit, which will, you know, it's probably going to be 130 or, or more uh, million dollar deal there um, where we're, we're kind of some of the capital for the equity bed of assets we're buying now. We've bought probably about 40 million so far this year with them. And, um, you know, now we get a line tied to that and it'll probably triple that uh, volume of what we could go buy. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're getting ready to get ramped up. Um, we anticipate you're going to see some more 
uh, distress in the market by the <laughs> towards the end of 21 for sure. Um, yeah. There is some moratoriums and some delays, so to speak, but I, we think some of that's going to open up. And, and you kind of saw it when the, with the first shutdown, you saw some, uh, some of the margins widening in some of the asset classes and some syndication wind downs. And so I was, one question I wanted to ask is, you know, with the money you raise, typically you put it in funds. Do you do a traditional um, you know, 506C or are you at a Reg A at this point in time or a mix of both? Um, I know back in the day when I started looking to invest in notes, um, I, you know, I reached out to, you know, one of your funds and spoke to one of the gentlemen at the time, I think it was a, a 506C, but I was at that yeah. point in time, but it's probably four or five years ago. I was just curious if you ever made a leap from one to the other. Um, we did look at the Reg A stuff, uh, which is really crowdfunding from more of the general public. Mm -hmm. um, and I, we went down that path, I actually invested some money and some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just we decided not to do that. And the reason being is um, we're kind of fortunate we have a broad audience of high net worth already. So mm -hmm. in some ways, we're kind of crowdfunding from the accredited or high net worth folks. Mm -hmm. And we really didn't have the need to go to the general public. You know, we always sold notes. So it's not like the general public couldn't invest in anything they could. But mm -hmm. they are definitely... Um, you, you need a lot of more administrative staff and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, of course, you're, some of the compliance is, is stricter. It's almost like you're a mini public offering almost to do a Reg A. It's pretty, pretty robust, although we're, we're doing some of that stuff anyway because of where we're headed, uh, yeah. kind of going down the RIA path and things like that. So, you know, we have audit, our funds are audited today. They weren't always, it, it's... Um, I just think if all of our funds had on probably maybe early on, we might've had a fund that had unaccredited as well years ago, but not for a long time. I, you know, it's been a long time and I don't that we, since we've had a fund like that. Um, it, it, it's just, I don't know, in some ways it's cleaner and, and simpler and we do generally solicit. Um, and yep. we use a third party accreditation company today. So we kind of, outsource some of that compliance you know it's yep. just a easier way to handle the volume no definitely and uh that was interesting because i'm you know light years behind you but i started you know having a putting a few funds together and you know i've done a b 506b which it had some unaccredited and of course can general solicit that i've done the 506c and i've seen others um put out a, a reg a and you know it's like okay yeah you can invest and some people toss a hundred bucks in there and stuff but Part of me is like, why would I want to deal with the headaches of certain people only investing like a hundred dollars and they a lot of K ones. Yeah, the over. You know, I mean, it's I just don't. I know actually, I have a buddy that does that. I just I don't know. It's mm -hmm. yeah, I guess it's okay. I mean, hey, look at Lending Club or whatever, yeah. right? They're kind mm -hmm. of that way, and but it's um, I don't know. I just uh, I understand it. I I know why people do it. Uh, I've been just lucky that I didn't really need to do it. So it's, uh, I, I just found a way to connect with a lot of high net worth folks and uh, it was an easier audience to deal with than in some ways. Yeah. So yeah. I just kind of focused on yeah. that. We'll, we'll come back to how you contacted high net worths later because that's a question I have down the line <laughs> uh, for people who are listening. Uh, there, is, and, there is some uh, yeah. techniques to some of that and some science behind some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but kind of roll into, um, you know, you, TPR now, you're really starting to diversify and expand the business model. Um, and, you know, it, like I mentioned before, we hopped on kind of, you know, I consider you an inst you know, in an institutional level with, you know, 100 plus million, maybe you might not, but you've really started building some strategic relationships with the AMIP and other things you've been doing. At first, you know, I'll be honest, I've always known, you know, PPR is kind of, you know, back in the day of, you know, investing in, jun you know, junior liens. And now, you're putting more money out into the first um, first space. And I think there's reason behind that. Um, what's kind of, you know, these changes in diversifying, you know, what's some of the main reasons behind it? And uh, how do you see it going? Or where do you see it going? Um, some of it was from supply and demand, right? Um, you know, pretty much pre-COVID was um, pretty high real estate market, right? So margins get thinner. Uh, supply of assets were, hard, you know, harder to find not as many junior liens were being written. 
for a long time, right? So, and there is a lag with distressed debt, you know, from, you know, how long has it been delinquent type stuff. But because we've bought junior liens that have been delinquent 10 years, for example, right? So that's, that's kind of the record, so to speak. Um, but uh, a lot of it came from our ability to raise capital, which became one of our strengths. And we were able to raise significant capital, but you have to, be, where can you deploy it? Uh, the beauty of first is you can deploy more capital. Margins are a little tighter, uh, but it, they're also less work in some ways. There's not as many touches. A, a junior lien requires a lot more touches. And um, let me see if I can give you an example of that. Um, you know, we might spend three or four million and get, you know, I don't know, call it six or 700 junior liens, which may require two asset managers. Uh, whereas first liens, I think we did uh, like a HUD trade or whatever, 25 million ish. And you would, you know, you, you know, you're, you're deploying quite a bit of money and I'll bet you it's not that many assets, you know, yeah. um, in fact, um, they, that person could probably handle four times that. So, you know, you might get 20, you know, about a hundred assets or something for that. And so you're, you can see how the difference is one person could manage probably a hundred million of yeah. first as yeah, opposed when, to junior liens where you can handle, you know, a smaller amount. You know, yeah. When you look at it, I mean, your first might be, you know, three, $400,000 loans um, on, you know, half a million dollar properties in the seconds, they might be, Fifty to one hundred thousand dollar lines, or you know, in that range. So your typical second is probably you know a third to a fifth the size potentially, in, in yeah. from that. And also juniors typically in the past, correct me if I'm wrong, usually would sell at a greater discount depending on if there's equity or not than a first. So they take the both those factors into consideration. And you know, from a bulk size, I'm guessing like you mentioned, with the same amount of money. Um, you're gonna buy. You'll have a large, much larger pool of seconds and first, which does take you know more asset managers to manage that. Now the the risks are different as well, and um, and the junior liens are definitely more statistical, unless you're in high equity junior liens or something. But the the first mortgages are definitely very geographical, sticks and bricks. You know they're they're actually sold differently. They're um, you know, you're always looking at fair market value and things like that. Whereas um, junior liens are a little different. You know, you're looking at, they're sold on UPB, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. they're sold. They're, they're, it's totally different philosophy in a way with, uh, you know, junior liens, you're typically exiting through the bar with uh, first mortgages, you're exiting through the property in most cases, right? So it's a, yeah. it's a different dynamic in a way. Now, as I tell my attorney, you know, uh, I don't have the patience for a second and I feel being, you know, in the real estate and construction, you know, with first, I'm like, all I care about is a property, you know, from that perspective. And mm -hmm. seconds, I feel like you almost have to be a therapist sometimes and, you know, figure out what's going yeah. on, what's the borrower's credit, you know, what's going to happen with them and kind of is, you know, a lot more philosoph not philosophical, but it's, you know, I think more brain twisting involved sometimes. <laughs> a lot on more seconds. Brain twisting. <laughs> and um, it, it is very statistical, like you're not going to get out you know, out of a hundred quality junior liens, you might only have favorable outcomes out of like 40 or 42 or something out of a hundred. And you don't know which 42 they are till you start digging into them. It's kind of like that, right? So it's, yep. whereas first mortgages, you're, you're trying to execute pretty much on every asset. Mm -hmm. Not saying you never have any, you know, fallout, you will, but you know, it's a little different. It depends what kind of first you're doing if you're doing low dollar first that's that's another animal as well so <laughs> yeah those chris those can be fun um, <laughs> got the back taxes are worth more than the property right? <laughs> so. I, i've had one where to cut the grass was more than what the property was worth so let's just let's just leave it at that um, yeah so i've seen some of that yeah In did you fact, sell that one uh, to me chris we're selling some of them right now if you want any they're out <laughs> nice Actually, I sold it, almost sold it to your good friend that starts with an M. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> oh, Jim, you're going to mention something? Yeah, so, I mean, do you just want to get a little more specific, Dave, as far as where you're headed with the, the partnerships and, and things yeah, like that? Yeah, I just... mean, sure. Um, you know, right now we have a liquidity fund. We have uh, two funds, a liquidity fund and an income fund, and they invest in different asset classes. And then we're, we're in the midst of... Um, 
developing a growth fund where they'll uh, a little longer term that'll have some tax advantages. So right now their liquidity fund invests primarily in reperforming assets and in hard money originations. And we do, uh, you know, we partnered up with uh, foundation actually mm-hmm. and foundations, uh, an AMIP affiliate as well. So um, that's a property portal to sell REOs and pre REOs. And, um, and they also do some, uh, hard money lending there. And we participate in some of that and, and some of those originations and in purchasing some of those as well. So um, and that's kind of what we do in our liquidity fund, which is shorter term uh, investment opportunities to high net worth folks. And the reason we have liquidity is because they're reperforming loans, the cash flow that are very liquid, you can sell them, um, those types of things. And typically, you know, we're making a spread between the coupon rate of that loan and what our cost of capital is. And sure, our rate, our returns are lower, but it's very liquid for a passive investor, right? Mm-hmm. So we have a six month option and a one year option. Um, and then in our income fund, it's more longer term. We, um, we pay higher yields to our investors. Uh, it's usually a three year time period. And we also give them the opportunity to compound their investment if they want to. And that fund typically invests in MPNs only, non-performing loans. And, um, you know, our yields obviously are higher than what we pay out there as well. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, the growth fund that we're working on, um, you know, and that to your point, uh, you know, JVing with folks like AMIP have enabled us to, you know, they definitely have more robust, uh, acquisitions, trade desk, and more efficient on operations of working through assets. Uh, they're a 50 plus person firm. And, um, you know, our expertise is more on the capital management side on raising the capital and all the SEC stuff. Um, so we we're pretty good on that side and on that marketing and all that. And uh, so we kind of teamed up and then the, uh, with the foundation model, we'll be selling a lot of pre REO and REO. So I think the, the new thing there is selling pre REO, which has not really been, you know, something that you saw a lot of it's a relatively newer idea where investors can, uh, you know, pinpoint a property and purchase it before it's even for all the way through the foreclosure process and obtain financing to obtain it as well mm-hmm. if they want it, you know, so they don't have to, but so I think that's just a unique opportunity to have like another REO platform. That's a little similar to an auction.com, but maybe a little more robust because you could buy a pre REO as well. And um, I think we're going to, be connecting with some institutional partners to push more product through that type of platform, which will be interesting. Just another channel for us because we didn't, we weren't really in, uh, in the origination space. So this is a way for us to enter the origination space. And what I like about it is it's dealing with commercial notes. Uh, they are short term, like hard money notes. Mm -hmm. Um, but they also don't have all the, Dodd-Frank type compliance to right. it. Yeah, you know, not all the headache with it. So that's sure. one of the things I like about that space. Uh, so for us, it's a, it's another channel to deploy capital and uh, bring in a couple other revenue centers. And then the um, the third piece is this growth fund idea, which is similar to a transactional funding, in the sense that um, we're doing a lot in the multifamily space and some of the commercial real estate space. But mostly uh, starting out with multifamily where we're the capital partner. We'll come in and provide all the capital if needed or most of it. Um, and we can also um, be takeout financing too. If you know, you're a multifam- multifamily investor and you're three or four years into the project, uh, we can come in and take out the investors that are there. You know, th- so there's a lot of... Uh, unique things we're doing there. And we're part, same similar thing where we're part, partnering with good operators and being the capital partner because it's um, not that uh, some of these folks can't raise money. They can, but it, wouldn't it be nice that they don't have to worry about at all raising money. They don't have to worry about a capital call at all. They don't mm-hmm. have to worry about refinancing at all. They don't have to worry about, you know, and how many, how many multifamily deals could they do if they had unlimited capital? It's really that kind of a question, right? So, well, And you also look at, you know, some of the other institutional lenders, depending on where you get it from, you know, and some that may have insurance money backing and stuff, you know, they, you know, you can have relationships with them. And, you know, I've seen this in the past and 
you know, you can tell me if it's different, but you may have, um, you know, a good relationship with them and get a deal going. And then they, um, <clears throat> you know, the second time around, even though they've got the relationship, it still can be sometimes a little trickier. You know, sometimes they're, they're more risk averse. So they may change their debt service credit ratio, you know, DSCRs down, um, you know, or, you know, from that perspective might have you hold a little more in reserves, which may change up the game a little bit. But if you got somebody who's more of a kind of, you know, a private equity type firm, you know, typically, and you've used them and so forth, you know, they're typically more, you know, not as risk averse, but still risk averse to put the money out uh, from that perspective. Would you agree with that? Or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And most of what we look at is under 40, 50 million in acquisition. So we're in that I don't say tweener space. You know how um, a lot of uh, multi guys are fine on the lower level. Then you have the real big level. You know we don't want to compete in the in the real expensive stuff. We kind of like that niche, and we're actually more interested in the operator than even the asset. I'm not saying we don't look at the asset. We do, and I'm not saying we don't look at the market. We do, but um, it's really all about the operator. How good they are at uh, managing not just the property management piece, but the business plan piece, if, if it's a value add, especially things like that. So we're, you know, we don't need a ton of these folks. We just need some of them. And we like people with long histories, long track records, really know what they're doing, have a good sourcing machine and uh, really execute in their market, you know, and for us, it's a great way to diversify. If we can get up to a dozen or so really good operators who get a half a dozen good deals a year, you know, we, for us, it's a, it's a great way for us to go in and deploy capital, recycle capital. And now investors that will be coming into our funds, instead of just investing in one syndication, we'll have similar returns and upside, but they're diversified in a pool of assets, right? So I think that's the value that we'll bring in the long run. And, um, yeah, I don't know how much that's being done out there right now. So I think yeah. it's a little unique. Yeah, it is unique. I've got a question for you, Dave. If uh, obviously you've got a ton of experience in all different uh, parts of of uh, real estate and mortgage note investing, um, was just wondering if you could speak to kind of the 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 little guy, maybe you know somebody on my level or or Chris's level. I, I don't usually call Chris a level little guy, but it's all relative, right? Um, so you know, some maybe a newer investor who, who uh, maybe does has. Uh, 10 to 50 first lien notes in their portfolio. If you were that person now, given the current market conditions, um, what would you be looking to do? How would you be looking to position, position yourself if, you know, somebody that's not quite in your, mm. your shoes right now? Well, I think you're going to see more product. So that's telling me you're going to need more capital. Um, <laughs> yeah, makes sense. So I would, uh, <laughs> it's like your money list, right? You know, how you have a buyer's list. It's like, let build the money list. Mm -hmm. And, and then also think about what, what can you leverage? You know, I've had a couple of uh, business coaches and uh, some of them are pretty high end. And really the main questions they were always asking me is, you know, what can you leverage in the next six or 12 months? It's going to catapult you personally or business wise. Mm -hmm. And what is that thing? And then when you repeatedly ask yourself that over time, the answers change. Uh, but it does get you thinking, uh, what could really, you know, what are you missing? What could you really leverage and focus on what you're really good at? For me, it took me, you know, I was probably 50 by the time I figured out what I was good at. Um, and, you know, and then not really focus on what I'm not good at, right? So it's, um, but, and then try to leverage that missing link. So, you know, for some of us, it's going to be different things. It's going to be capital. It's going to be a JV partner. It's going to be education. It's going to be, you know, a source. It's going to be technology. It's going to be different things for different folks, right? Yeah. Um, but I think uh, it's figuring that out and knowing what you can do to uh, leverage that. I mean, we have, you know, what I'm trying to leverage this year is dramatically different than what I was trying to leverage last year or the year before, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's shifts. And it's back to those, you know, it's like three pillars of any business. It's capital, it's sources of product, and then it's like scalability type stuff, you know. How many notes could you handle if the notes were free? <laughs> handle 100, 10,000, you know, 
50,000, at some point you're shutting down, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, that's a good point. And it might be at 50, I don't know. Yeah, you know, you're at different stages. So I'm not knocking that. I've been at every stage. So um, no, the kudos to you. And, and well, that's a, that's a great question that you ask in the sense that you have to ask yourself, am I trying to be uh, an investor that's happy with just passive cash flow? You know, I have a really good friend that actually started out when I did, and that's what he does. He's just, he's happy with his, you know, nice little mini pool of notes, I'll call it. It's not even that small or anything. He lives very good. He's got a beach life. He's, you know, mm -hmm. I can't knock him. He probably has a, a much more mellow life than I do. Mm -hmm. Or do you want a business? Do you want to build a saleable business? You know, they're totally different goals. Sure. And there's nothing wrong with either one of them. It's really what do you want and what fits you. And, and then, you know, so you might have 50 notes and your goals to get to, I don't know, a hundred notes. I know um, this will, this will kind of tell you the story. I remember when I was a young man, I, my one goal when I was a contractor and I was a realtor part-time, my goal was to buy one house a year. I was going to do that for 20 years. I was going to pay them all off, have 23 and clear I was going to live happily ever after. And then I was going to sell a note a year and live off that, that property and maybe even hold the paper on it. And I was just going to chill. Well, yeah, that went out the window, right? <laughs> then it became, you know, I want a hundred houses and then I want a hundred, you know, free and clear. And then it became, no, I don't want, I got to 40 and I'm like, no, I don't want a hundred houses. It's too much aggravation. I, I want a hundred notes, you know, and then, you know, it kind of led from there and then it shifts. Right. So, I don't know that it's really what's right for you might not be what's right for me or, or Chris, sure. but, but it's a great question that you want to ask. So clearly you know how to raise money. Um, I think that's, you know. Yeah, that was really kind of the, the only the, the secret sauce for me. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, do you, how did you do it? Or if somebody was, you know, if you were, somebody was sitting across the table from you and said, Dave, how should I raise my first million or 5 million? You know, what are two things that I should do or two things I should walk away from this call or this conversation <laughs> on? What would those be? Wow. Uh, well, ra raising capital is uh, obviously nothing's harder than raising capital for notes because it's like an intangible, right? It's not like, Hey, here's the blueprint to the building I'm raising money for, or here's the house on the, you know, or here's the rehab. Cause then it's, you can see it, you can touch yeah. it, you can go drive by it and all that. With notes is a little harder, right? So, um, but you have to present that model. You have to present some case studies. You have to be credible. You have to be authentic. You can't be hokey. Um, you want to be trustworthy, right? All, your reputation precedes you. So, um, you know, if you have a bad reputation, you're gonna have a tough time raising money. <laughs> but <true>. the, um, <laughs> but then, okay, let's assume you have all that good stuff. You have a good story, and you have a good model, and it makes sense. Well, now it's, you know, how do I get in front of more people? Because it's just a numbers game, like any sales type thing, you're selling subscriptions, basically. Mm -hmm. So how do I get in front of the right people and more of them? And in the beginning, I always thought it was, well, you know, I need to know more people and go to more networking meetings and all that kind of stuff. And, and sure, that works to a point. And then I kind of tapped into other people's networks as well. But you guys are kind of doing it here with this medium, the, you know, the mm -hmm. podcast. For me, it was writing for Bigger Pockets kind of yeah. changed that. And what flipped that switch was it became less about who I knew and who knew me. Yeah. So, and mm -hmm. that's when you start to get in the groove where, um, you know, now it's, it's, it's a lot different game, um, especially when, when, when that happens. And, it, it, you know, it's a positive thing. It's a good thing. But it also took some commitment. Like I probably wrote articles for about five years, mm -hmm. right? Just like you're doing a podcast for what, however many episodes. So it is a big commitment to grow an audience and uh, have a good message that people want to mm -hmm. tune into or, or read or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, hopefully good results come from that. So that was part of it. And then there's some other stuff you can do too. Like I used to do stuff with charities like a lot of people don't think about those kind of angles where, hey, there's a lot of high net worth that are involved in charities. So go get out there and help out in the community. Or well, your isn't your Mid Atlantic Summit? Uh, isn't that tied? Yeah, to it was a, charity? a charitable based uh, mm -hmm. thing. Um, you know, we used to donate it all to the homeless and mm -hmm. Project Home. But yeah, right. Like try to think of uh, 
you know, something bigger than you. Like if you're doing something that's bigger than you and you're trying to raise money, it's, e well, it's obviously easier to raise money for charity than Chris's crazy note deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's much crazy. easier to give, you know, right. <laughs> raise money for battered women than to give Chris money for uh, who knows what he's raising money right. for. So how much do you think you've raised off of bigger pockets? Cause I know I've, you know, got a good, you know, and again, oh, for wow. my portfolio percentage wise, but cur curious, cause I have I'm curious what this answer is. It's a, it's a, it's a tough question to answer because I, it's hard for me to look at it quite that way because yeah. um, I, I, I kind of look at it differently and I'll tell you why. So usually um, in any kind of sales position, cause I, you know, I sold insurance, I sold real estate, I, you know, you're selling mm -hmm. subscriptions to a fund, whatever you're selling. Um, and you know how it takes maybe seven to 10 touches to get mm -hmm. a client to come into the fold, so to speak. Yep. Well, one of the, one of the things about, um, you know, bigger pockets or a podcast or anything like that, a speaking event, um, is that it'll act as a touch. Mm -hmm. yep. So now the beauty of bigger pockets is you can touch a lot of people quickly and in volume. Um, you know, I've done the, you know, touring around the country, speaking at RIA meetings or hotels and all that good stuff. I'm not knocking that. Um, and there's some efficient ways to do that as well. But with a, you know, a podcast like Bigger Pockets, you're going to hit a lot of people. That's a lot of hotel trips, right? And, um, but you can also maximize some of the stuff you're doing. So I'll give you an example of something me and my, my son works for, my younger son works for PPR. And we used to come up with some crazy stuff because he's, you know, a younger guy. And um, here's an example. Like if I was flying to Dallas to do uh, an event, well, when I'm at the hotel, I would do a meetup on, I don't know, node investings. I would bring like a pocket full of zip drives. I'd have a happy hour. I'd buy some more d'oeuvres. And from four to seven or five to eight, I'd have a happy hour in the lobby of the hotel. Hey, I'm going to talk about node investing. Send out a meetup in Dallas. I don't even have people's emails. And next thing you know, I got 40, 50 people mm -hmm. in, the, in the lobby of the bar, bar lobby. Yep. And I'm handing out zip drives about node investing. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't even what I was going to, right? Mm -hmm. That was just, hey, I got to hang out the night before the event anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I might as well get more mileage out of that event. And if you do that in like New York City, you'll have 50, mm -hmm. 60 people in that. Mm -hmm. And you don't even, you've never met them. You don't even have their emails. You don't even need them. You're just connecting through Meetup, you know? Yeah. So Junior was good at that kind of stuff. You know, I'm old school. I don't, you know, what's Meetup, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> but um how's that work again all i know is just go to this hotel buy some big hors d'oeuvres and uh hand well, out zip drives okay i don't know you were able to get on the zoom call better than i was so. yeah there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> but uh sometimes just simple commonsensical things like that where if you're traveling to i don't know how many cities a year well you, now you maximize more or, or whatever you know Nobody's traveling right now, so we can zoom. Yeah, no one's traveling right now. So this is how you're doing it. But it is, you know, I love I love the podcast. And as I get older or, you know, don't have to do it as much, my strategy shifts a little. I'm more of a stay in touch but be out of reach kind of guy these days. <laughs> yeah. um, and one of the kind of points I just want people to understand too is, you know, in bigger pockets, when you know it's so real estate focused, so that's a benefit of it um, that you can reach so many people. But again, it was the consistency and commitment that you made to constantly write those articles to get your name on bigger pockets, and then people think, okay, note investors, oh, Dave Van Horn. You know, I think of like real estate agents. I think Russell Brazil, who's you know up the street from me, um, you know, yeah, is on there a lot, and you know him and you know James Wise out in Cleveland, um, and so forth. But people, when you get branded and make that commitment and get that brand. Um, it's, I mean, just so powerful to propel your business, uh, from that, you know, from that perspective. Yeah. A yeah. lot of great stuff happened with bigger pockets. So uh, we, we, me and my son, my son was an English major and a, and a script writer actually. And, um, you know, it was, he always lived in like LA and New York and mm -hmm. we would write these articles and he would edit them. And, you know, I'm not much of a writer. I'm more of a talker. And he'd be like, all right, dad, you, you know, you have English in school, you know, but uh, we would write articles together and we probably wrote for, I don't know, I bet you seven or eight months and like nothing happened. 
yeah. right? So picture writing, you're like, is anybody reading any of this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's what you, that's commitment, right? Yeah. But then again, a lot of good things happened where, you know, I've met a lot of great people. I'm friends with Jay Scott and Darren mm-hmm. Sager and, you know, Brand, you know, Brandon and David Green. Like I would have mm-hmm. never met all these folks over the years uh, if, it, mm-hmm. if that didn't happen. And, um, you know, get to speak in New York at, at Darren's group or something like that, where, you know, there's a lot of people there that'll fly in. And I, that's how I met Ryan Murdoch. You know, it just goes on and on and on. And you're like, um, you, would, you wouldn't have met those great people along the way. And uh, no, it's just a powerful network. It, you know, I'm even Josh, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, I've talked to Josh on, on many occasions. I'm like, um, you know, I don't even know that he thought it would end up like where no, it just, is, you know, it. yeah. it's just the, yeah. one of those things, but talk about, you know, committed. I mean, oh, yeah. nobody was more committed than Josh. Right. So mm-hmm. I also find just to piggyback on that real quickly with the preparing for the podcast or, or I also will write some blog posts, you know, fairly regularly. It just helps to kind of frame it helps me to look at my business and my goals and figure out where I'm headed. So even if nobody reads it, <laughs> it yeah. seems like it's beneficial to kind of collect my own thoughts and get my, you know, research things on my own. Um, and then it helps me stick with it and then hopefully, you know, grow, grow the business from there. Yeah. I, I guess the the approach would be to write or to go into the forums or something like that. I mean, for me, it, the articles happened and they asked me to be on uh, the podcast and I was, uh, I was pretty early on. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, then that kind of led to a book, right? Yeah. Bigger yeah. pot, you know, so one thing led to another and then, and um, actually this year we were actually supposed to be the head sponsor for uh, the New Orleans mm-hmm. event and then it yeah. got kabushed, right? So, uh, you know, it, it's just funny how things have evolved. And today we're, uh, you know, we advertise pretty, pretty good on, uh, on BP these days and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, running a lot of ads. It's come full circle. It's uh, now I'm paying them. No, <laughs> I'm only kidding, but it's uh, it's all good though. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, so, go ahead. Jamie looks like you were going to ask a question. Nope. Go ahead. Um, so you know, you're you mentioned you've got a, a personal portfolio uh, as well besides you know PPR. Do you have yeah. a different approach from one to the other? Out of curiosity. Uh oh yeah, dramatically different. Um so. Mine's pretty simple. Like I was saying, I only invest in three areas, right? Mm-hmm. I only, um, and I have short-term, mid-term, long-term investments. And then I also have stuff that's tax advantage that isn't tax advantage. And then I also try to earmark the capital to the investment. Uh, a lot of times based on what is my cost of capital. Mm-hmm. So I try to line things up better than you know, some people might. And then as far as note investing on a personal level, I only invest in performers. Mm-hmm. And of course I'm in some note funds, but the, um, but then I do some other stuff. I do some commercial notes and, and some merchant, merchant cash, you know, uh, which are, uh, commercial notes on receivables and things like that. I do some ATM investing and <laughs> do some other things. Um, and then of course, real estate, I'm in some commercial syndications and apartments, um, things like that. But, um, and then I have, you know, some stuff's risky and some stuff's less risky. And then I kind of have a mix that way, but I don't really deviate too far. I just kind of diversify within those channels. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, I have a quick question. I, I think I've heard you mention this previously on a podcast, uh, but uh, Chris and I had the Wealth Without Wall Street guys on, and that's a whole, whole different rabbit hole of uh, infinite banking and all that. But yeah, I think you've mentioned previously that you have used whole life insurance or some yeah. are borrowed against a life insurance policy. I was just curious if you could quickly touch on that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it can be a touchy subject because um, life insurance sales is such a, I don't know what you would call it. <laughs> um, controversial. But there is a lot of different types of policies and that's part of the confusion, right? And uh, put it this way, the wealthy use insurance completely different than the middle class or lower classes folks do right where they're they're typically using insurance to replace income whereas the wealthy are using it more in a banking concept or to build wealth or preserve wealth that or to pass on wealth so it's just a different strategy and different types of policies and um i do use the personal banking concept and i do the um 
business banking concept too, with key man policies and things like that. Uh, so there are some good strategies. And once you max out your qualified plans, th mm -hmm. then where else can you put money that's mm -hmm. a good bucket, right? So if you're like a family office and you're managing 200 million, mm -hmm. well, your self-directed IRA investments not really help them move the needle on the tax savings, right? right so you, right. you're kind of in a different realm. So you got to start to utilize other, other vehicles. Makes and that's one, that's one of those areas that you can utilize uh, to build a lot of wealth with. And a builder had taught me that when I was like 19. He was mm -hmm. borrowing money out of policies to build a house. He'd make like 100 grand on the house, then he'd pay the policy back. Yeah, and it kind of cool. taught me, and you can do that with notes, right? So you can have a, uh, there's certain policies that allow you to build up cash value very quickly. Mm -hmm. Some of them, like the typical ones they sell you are, you know, they have a lot of death benefit, but the cash value doesn't kick in until like 20 years from now. Well, right. there's other ones that it kicks in in 12 and 15 months. Well, that's night and day. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can access that capital, even if I'm borrowing my own money at four and 5% and I can mm -hmm. go out and make a 12 or 15% on my note. Yeah. Well, next thing you know, you know your note is paying for your policy or pay, help lowering the cost of that policy. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. a different animal. Um, it's really about what can you you know, what can you do with that investment? And that, that's really what I do. I use the arbitrage of my policies. Mm -hmm. The other thing is your policy will continue to grow. Like you'll get a dividend on that policy. Like the money's still there, even though you borrowed it out. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that or look at that or, um, and then it passes favorably to heirs. And I can own a lot more real estate that's leveraged if I have insurance in place, right? So if I have, a, mm -hmm. you know, $5 million in insurance coverage, and I have $3 million worth of real estate, does it matter when I pay it off? <laughs> that's, no. a, that's irrelevant, that's really, right? That's like, yeah, yeah, it can be paid off anytime. And, and, and you, up until recently, you'll get a stepped up basis. I don't know what's going to happen going forward. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people, uh, that gives you a certain level of freedom and peace mm -hmm. of mind yeah. that I think a lot of people discount. You know? Yeah, I've started doing it myself as well. And I, I don't know why it has to be so controversial. You know, you don't have to sell out and go buy your groceries with infinite banking necessarily, but you know, why not use it as a one more tool? That's kind of my. Yeah, it's a tool. My, it's just a tool and yeah, it, yeah. it's used properly. Unfortunately, the sales people mm -hmm. in this, in the system is what makes it so mm -hmm. contentious, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. If you're sure, like salesman are right there with car salesmen, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> right. Unfortunately, that's the oh. issue. One thing I want to jump back to because uh, just briefly and kind of, you know, with the, the scale of your company, it does sound because you mentioned you've got the different types of funds, um, liquidity and, you know, growth and opportunity funds and so forth. But, you know, you keep them as 506Cs because it's simplified and stuff, but also you give a preferred return to your investors. It seems like you do keep things very simple, just down to, you know, the basics of blocking and tackling and try not to overthink how you do something and, and just keep things simplified. Um, not, you know, from that perspective, and I'm the same way, I try and keep things as, you know, simple, stupid as possible is what, what I like to say. I'm just curious, is that kind of something, I mean, it, you know, that you as a company, you try and not overcomplicate things, especially at the size you're at, or would you disagree with me and say, oh God, no, it's much more, I know being a company that size is, complex and managing yeah the no we're, systems we're, and we're too complicated and we're always trying to simplify yeah. <laughs> so, no i mean we have struggles and issues just like anybody else so mm -hmm. it's um you know i wish we were problem free all the mm -hmm. time but that's yeah. half the fun right <laughs> yeah but what i was trying to refer to is like i know some newer investors as they start a fund they try and put out there like okay different returns for different people at this point in time, or then yeah. we'll try and waterfall it and, you know, give excess distributions and then, do, you know, and then try and keep it open-ended with excess distributions, which would just be a complete financing disaster. I mean, accounting. Yeah, they overcomplicate yeah. the yeah. options. And we, we did that early on. We used to mm -hmm. have, we, we've probably made every mistake you can make. <laughs> um, so we, we had like early on, we had too many choices, too many options, too many. And, it just keeps you on the phone explaining it all <laughs> longer, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, the fear was, oh, you know, you won't get any investors if you didn't have a lot of options. I mean, today it's like two options. Do you want chocolate or vanilla? You know, it's like, <laughs> and we don't really have 42 different options. It, that never really worked well for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of learned that early on. Just like, 
we learned that people prefer monthly payments over quarterly payments or whatever that is. You know, you, if you try different things, you'll realize, Hey, this works way better than this. Or, mm -hmm. um, we also had the long, the wrong terms, like the length of time where, yeah, it was great for the investor. It just didn't work for us <laughs> you know, as a company. So mm -hmm. we, we, we kind of settled into, um, you know, what time frames work for what asset classes and things like that and what rates work. And what do you think what time frame works for a note fund? Uh, we kind of like the three year thing. Um, <laughs> unless it's a, That's what mine are. That's why I'm cheering. Unless it's a, a, you know, like a performing note fund where it's got a lot of liquidity, then you could do one of the advantages of that for us is we can do shorter terms and, and have lower rates. Uh, yeah. So sometimes it's about what's your blended cost of capital too, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, once you can bring in some leverage, let's say if you can get some institutional money, it's really, even if my rate's real high, what's my blended rate, you know, yeah, once I, I get some institutional money. I realize with, you know, one of mine that if I would have done five years and with the preferred and stuff, I'm like, wow, I would not have made, you know, it takes a long, you know, be much longer yeah. to get my money back. Um, and, you know, with the three years, I did three years because I looked at a typical note is 12 to 18 months. So I want to try and get two turns, you know, on it with, yeah. uh, on the non-performing, but. Yeah, that's the whole goal, right? You get as many yeah. turns as you can in that time frame. Um, another thing that works well for us is compounding where, you know, <clears throat> significant number of people mm -hmm. compound. So uh, it helps with cash flow early on or, yep. you know, different things like that. So there's, mm -hmm. there's definitely strategies you can employ that, mm -hmm. Um, helps you regulate the capital, right? It, am I trying to, um, you know, just knowing what you're, depends what you're investing in, but you can do, do. Well, I can tell you, Dave, I, I was invested in one of your funds. I don't know if you know oh, that, <laughs> but- um, Is that good or bad? Oh, <laughs> all good. I mean, I have never seen, it was like clockwork, just on the first every month, just- Yeah, it's pretty boring. <laughs> it's, it's, I didn't learn a lot. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah. I, I have nothing bad to say whatsoever. So yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, it's just ACH the first business day, and yeah, so that's Jamie, about he, it. Pay, he pays much better than I paid you on our JV deal. <laughs> yeah, because he paid me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, Jamie and I laugh. We had a JV deal in Maryland that um, this borrower just was painful, and um, it just uh, took a very long time. It was non-performer that was brutal. So, but we ended up doing, we made out at the end. Well, Jamie did. Yeah. Or they, hey, we've all, we've all had those. I mean, we have all yeah. kinds of worse stories, right? So, yeah. but I think that's the beauty of our investors. They don't really have to worry about that. We kind of do all that worrying and. Yeah. And, uh, very passive. Yeah. It mm -hmm. makes it very passive, but yeah. And the same way with notes, we have, you know, for years and years, we had a note warranty. So that peace of mind enabled us to probably sell more notes than some folks or. So Tell me a little bit about the note warranty. Um, you know, just um, it was real simple. It was just investment principal minus payments received, and it's mm -hmm. just designed so that you wouldn't lose your principal. And it was a buyback option for us to buy it back. We don't have to buy it back. Mm -hmm. uh, there are cases where we would give you an attorney referral if you wanted one, and mm -hmm. but sometimes it makes more sense for the person to exit through the property, maybe. But yeah. but uh, people like the peace of mind that mm -hmm. hey, in a worst case scenario, hey, they'll actually buy this back. Uh, and if their warranty was passed, mm -hmm. like if, if they've already collected more than they invested, mm -hmm. um, then we would, we would actually give them a price to buy, still buy the, the non-performing yeah. asset off them. Right. So it's a, mm -hmm. uh, but if somebody has a portfolio and they have, I don't know, 20 loans in it and one hiccups on them, you know, it's not the end of the world. They, they're looking at what am I making in my whole portfolio usually. Right. So it's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a peace of mind thing for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and some, sometimes we do get a little bit of a premium for the note because you have the warranty, but okay, yeah. then go out and buy one without a warranty. And then yeah. you're, <laughs> next thing you know, you're in the NPN business and uh, there's a lot more requirements. Um, yeah, I guess it's, you know, it's just one of those things. I don't think people realize how much work is involved with NPNs and people hear note investing and can be passive and, oh yeah, performing notes can be passive because you just get a collective mortgage payment every month. NPNs is not a passive, you know, business. No, um, no. And That's when, probably my my note tip of the day is uh, <laughs> specialize or minimize your your risk. You know, try to share or shift risk mm -hmm. to anywhere. 
operating partners, wherever. Um, and it, especially in the note business, uh, it's a heavily, it, you know, heavily regulated now. Uh, I mean, look what we've done. We, yeah. we were a company that took all the risk and today uh, we don't take as much risk in every area. You know so what I mean? So. Kind of you hit upon kind of next topic. I just want to touch base on before we wrap up this episode. And you mentioned, um, you know, risk and, you know, regulations coming down the pike. Where do you see the note space, you know, coming up in the next, you know, 12 to, I call it, I'll say 12 to 36 months because notes are always delayed. And if there is any regular, let me get my crystal ball. Let me, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, you were around, I mean, you were around, you know, during kind of, you know, I'll say heavily involved during the last downturn. I think this one's going to be, you know, if there's downturn, it's going to be different or the number of, we know there's more non-performing notes uh, or non loans being non-performing at this point in time, you know, do they make it to the market? Have banks gotten smarter? I mean, you know, some of that stuff. I mean, you know, again, pull out your crystal ball and yeah, there you go. Kind of see. He only wants me to go out 36 months. <laughs> yeah, it's not that far. No, that's right? easy. Piece of um, cake. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I guess um, short term, right? You kind of know what's going on. Um, you just got through an election. You're going to have, and you're right. I've been through. I was in an up market before the before 07, 08, and 09, then there was a crash. And then there's a lag too, because the stress that there's a little bit of a lag. That's and why I said three years. <laughs> and then obviously, you know, it was crazy for a while. Um, I mean, some, you know, I've paid 12 cents for a first mortgage before. Do you I think PayPal. that will ever happen again though? Because I think people do think that will happen. I hope not. <laughs> not like it. No, but you, you know, um, and then obviously prices went back up and, you know, some people, you know, it's funny. I, I was hearing people complaining about the prices of assets. When I started in the junior lien business, it was not unheard of us for us to pay 60 cents for a junior lien or 70 cents. And, mm. and they go, wow, well, how could it possibly, you yeah, know, yeah. And what they don't understand is that if a property is worth 300 grand and the first is 50 grand and the second's 50 grand and I bought it for yeah, 30, right? still if, 20 I, grand if I bought grand. it for uh, 60, 70 cents, I was still going to make money. And it was just a matter of when, and in an up market, it's usually quicker. Yeah. You know, it's a time for money equation usually. So it's a, you know, it wasn't that crazy. And you saw that with first, you saw first trading in the eighties, you know, and your people are like, oh, how can that be? <laughs> well, what's the ARV on that thing? Your biggest mm -hmm. risk was that they were going to pay you. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you're, point. you know, so when you factor in, if you bought a pool first and you got a lot of vacancy and you know, that ARV might, you know, you might buy a, a million dollar mortgage for 800,000, but if it's worth 1.4 million with 150 grand put into it, yeah, that's that's yeah, so that's bad, right. you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, or whatever, you know, make it stuff up, but um, you got to put it in perspective, right? So it's, um, you know, I don't know that people, they just look, what's the cost per on the dollar? They're not looking at what's really going on, right? But I think right now you're you're heading into, sure, we have a lot of moratoriums and uh, eviction moratoriums, things like that, but eventually that's going to lift, I think. And um I think you're going to see a definite second half of the year in 21. And, and I think it's what'll depend on how robust it is will be how much stimulus they give us now. Yeah. And the stimulus is late to be honest mm -hmm. with you. So every day that goes by that they don't put stimulus in, it's really just hurting us as an economy, mm -hmm. as a, as a country. Mm -hmm. So all that nonsense they're going through right now of just not getting stimulus out. And you can see that these, you can see that the retail sector is getting pummeled. <sighs> the office space yeah. is going to get hammered. Yeah. And will that trickle down into the single family space eventually? Maybe. I think so far the single family space has been doing pretty well. I think that has a lot to do with the shortage of assets for you know people to buy. There's a shortage of housing. There, if you really think about it, new construction is still not back to where it was yeah. before the last crash in volume. Uh, you also have cheap capital, right? So right. that's that's a big thing. And then you have a lot of household formation going on. Mm -hmm. So all that's what's driving a lot of this. Um, you know, you're seeing the single family space get really, it's it's still a seller's market for sure. Now, will that start to shift towards the end of 21? Yeah, I think it could, especially as distressed, more distressed assets start to hit. Uh, mm -hmm. And as, you, as all these foreclosures hit the market, the courthouses are going to be jammed when they open back up. That's for sure. I, I mean, I'm getting dates already, you know, for some that have been in the pipeline now for 
March, April. April. Yeah. yeah. And I had another investor text me last night that said they're supposed to have it. It's been postponed twice. And now it's not till like July. And I was like, wow. you know, but at some yep. point the music will stop. Yep. Um, and will everybody be back to work or will they be working as much or in the same uh, level that they were working? And we kind of know that answer, right? It's yep. going to be a, it, it kind of yep. comes back to, um, and I don't know this, what will the permanent change in behavior be after some of this is over, right? Like, are people still going to be nervous? Are you, you know, I look at myself, I used to fly around a lot. Am I going to fly around quite as much? Probably not. Am I going to, you know, do as much, you know, different things that I used to do? Or am I going to be more in my new mode? Am I going to go in the office every day? Or am I going to want to sit around in my pajama, my smoking jacket? And, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or whatever. You're gonna you, get the, you get the yeah. idea. You're going to, um, you know, you're, you've gotten used to some of what's going on right now. And you're not going to want to go back to the, the way things were. Um, yeah, they talk about normal, but you're definitely going to be doing things different. Do I need as much office space? No. You know, do I need every employee in the office five days a week? No. So we already know that, right? So yeah. it's going to be different. I, there's going to be an overabundance of office space for sure. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. Now you have a new administration and all, and you're going to see, you know, some of the tax changes that are proposed. You kind of know where that's going. You kind of, you've kind of been there before. You kind of know what that's going to be. Now, how much of that will go through? That'll depend on what's going on in Georgia. In Georgia. Yeah. Uh, how much debate there's going to be. Um, you know, you, sh you can see what the plans are, but will they all get implemented? That's a whole nother story, right? So mm -hmm. I don't know that you can lose sleep over most of that. Uh, you kind of know what that's going to do. Even if it went 100% of the way, uh, people are just going to figure out the next workaround for whatever. Mm -hmm. um, does it mean people aren't going to invest in real estate? I don't know. If your capital gains is ordinary income, does that mean you're going to pull out of all your, you're, you're going to stop owning multifamily apartments that are real passive and have a tax break? Like, I don't know. I mean, are you going to really just, everybody's going to head for the elevator? I don't know. I just, and then we'll change again, you know? So it's, it's hard to say some of that stuff, but it looks like the top one to one and a half percent might get hit with some taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, nobody's ever, no one's ever excited about tax increases. Um, but I, th I think it's kind of been, you know, I think it's kind of expected in a way. Yeah. I don't know. You've been successfully investing in many different market conditions over decades. So there's, yeah, I mean, look at, look at uh, when John Kennedy was in office, the tax rate was 90%, right? Nobody talks about that, right? So it's just like, yeah. um, I, when I started investing in real estate, interest rates were 14 I remember owner occupied house. I paid 11% and six points and I lived in it and I was happy to get that mortgage. And guess what? I made money on that house. Wow. I remember my first loan, the first house I bought was in 2001 and I was, um, I was 26 and I was supposed to close the day after nine 11 and it got postponed. But um, at that point in time, it was like, you know, interest rates were 6% and my parents were like, you know, back from the, you know, in the seventies and eighties when, you know, they bought, their house in the seventies, you know, it was like eight, 6%. That's unbelievable. Like, you know, lock that yeah, in and get great. a fixed rate. Cause you'll never get lower than that. And now, you know, this is free money right now. That's what I tell people that, you, you know, people are like, Oh, it just went to, you know, 3.75. I'm like, are you, you're kidding. Right. Yeah, like right. stop. Right. <laughs> so, um, but no, it's a, uh, it's kind of normal. I, you could see the, I think SFRs are going to be okay. I mean, they might cool off a little bit or just level off a little bit if you have a big uptick of uh, you know, more product or you have, um, you know, will the Fed step in and try to, you know, walk, walk, play around with the inflation and will, they, will eventually some of the rates start to rise a little bit? And that could put a little bit of cooling off on the SFR space, mm -hmm. but I don't see anything crazy like where it's like a big decline that I'm expecting or anything. Um, I don't know how the government can raise rates too much because of all the they're money they borrowed. Wild, I yeah, I mean, they borrowed so much money that it's, they're the ones who are going to have, you know. We'll no, have to we, I'm talking money. about like if things got crazy or, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. would they start to step in and try to do yeah. some more? Oh, okay. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. And, and if you really think about it, 80% of the increase in taxes is going to impact that top one, the one and a half percent more than yeah. everybody else. And if they do, you know, what they want to spend the money on, it looks like is mostly education, healthcare, uh, R&D, uh, infrastructure, 
Mm-hmm. Um, the increase in tax in the beginning could be a little bit painful for people, but mm-hmm. what it'll do is it'll force people to go out and make more money. Yep. And in the long run, it could be actually beneficial. We'll get GDP up and, and most of the economists are thinking it will. Mm-hmm. So it's like a short term pain for a longer term gain type scenario is what mm-hmm. a lot of the economists are thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we'll see, you know, nobody knows, but I'm more of a, um, you know, tell me the rules and I'll play the game kind of guy. I'm not a guy trying to figure out the game in advance. I'm usually, um, you know, whatever you do come up with, I'll just find some kind of work around or I'll shift gears into something else. So, you know, a lot of, uh, some of like, like I was telling you with my money, I'll take qualified plan money and I'll put that into something that gets taxed because then the taxes don't impact me. Then if I have after tax dollars, I might put that into, you know, a multifamily syndication because I get all kinds of depreciation. Right now I'm getting bonus depreciation, but that could go away. But, you know, I'm marrying that type of what kind of capital is getting going into what investment and then shifting gears. But you're going to see, I think you're going to see tax breaks for things like solar and energy efficient stuff. Mm -hmm. I have a buddy that has an energy fund, right? Well, you might get a ton of tax breaks over there all of a sudden. And now the, uh, you know, the oil industry subsidies will go away, right? So, oh, okay, well, I'm going to put my money in this, in solar and wind now instead of this, you know. So it's not, um, I'm not going to lose sleep over that, I don't think. Yeah, that's a great comment you made about, you know, don't worry about what you're getting taxed, just worry about how you're going to go earn it back and make more off of it. And, you know, I've kind of followed that same philosophy of, you know, tell me what the rules are and I'll go figure out how to, you know, I'll, I'll master the game, you know. I mean, we need some taxes, right? That yep. You're paying the golden goose that lays the egg uh, for all of us to live in a great place and yep. have a great business, right? So it's mm-hmm. just a kind of a necessary thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm not always thrilled with what they're spending it on. Don't take it the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> or how they're doing it, but, you know, I'll yeah. play along. Uh, Jamie, before we wrap up, any final questions, thoughts? I had one last question. Uh, two quick questions, but um, go, go so for it. my first was, um, you know, random question, but why did you sell a title company out of curiosity if you're in the note space? I was, um, most of my title business was coming from my real estate group and right after the crash, the real estate group kind of okay. you know, went nowhere because all we, you know, all I was as a realtor, all I sold was real estate investment property. Okay. So I might sell Jamie might buy five houses from me this year and you might buy seven houses from me this year. So I didn't, I dealt with a few select folks okay. who bought mm-hmm. a lot of houses mm-hmm. and um, when all the financing went away, mm-hmm. well, the title went away. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, actually it's funny. Um, I'm still great friends with my former partner. I still send her business. I have, actually have this closing come out with her at her office, but I told her, I said, Hey, this isn't fair anymore. I'm really not contributing enough to folks. Yeah enough biz so let's Mm -hmm. wind it down so we were in it about six years i guess something like that six seven years my last question was when you were getting started and stuff who was your role model who were you trying to um you know for um for which business i've been in like 42 business (laughs) the notes for the note space (laughs) well in the beginning it believe it or not one of the first speakers i saw was jimmy napier and then uh donna bauer uh Actually, I was just talking to Donna about I just did a, a boot camp thing with her, which is like bizarre, but we were friends from long ago. Mm-hmm. And um, I had no idea what a note was. I thought it was a musical symbol or, you know, <laughs> I thought a loan meant to be all by myself. But, uh, <laughs> nice. you know, she kind of got me into the game initially, like just, you know, explaining it. And I'm like, what's this note thing? You know, it, re- it was really just a, a, a way to become more efficient with my real estate investing. And what I realized if I utilized leverage better and became more efficient with what I was currently doing, I didn't need to own as many properties or I didn't need to. And what I liked about notes was it was very scalable, you know, like a buy at a discount, with a high yield um, and with collateral, right? So that beat it, you know, years ago, I used to play around trading options this kind of beat that for me because I like the collateral component. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the question again? Well, the, the non-performing note business, it's hard to look up to anybody because it's such a sketchy mm-hmm. business. <laughs> <laughs> Who did I look you can up say to? that again. Huh? Yeah. You can say that again. Yeah. yeah I mean, I guess you could count on one hand how many ethical operators there are. <laughs> um, 
you can count on more than two how many unethical ones there are. So yeah. yeah. No, you know what? I, I have a good friend, uh, Jack Krupe from PRP, mm -hmm. and um, Jack does some consulting work with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always looked up to Jack and what he was mm -hmm. able to build at PRP, and mm -hmm. uh, and I do look up to you know Ron McMahon, what he's built at AMIP in just a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, very savvy guy. Um, so there, I guess there's some of the folks I do look up to, but, mm -hmm. and, you know, Mike Dario, uh, who's over there at their trade desk. Mm -hmm. um, he's a, you know, he was at uh, Condor Capital mm -hmm. previous to that. And uh, some of those folks I, I do look up to because they really know their craft. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, but, but you're right. Like there's plenty of uh, <laughs> sketchy folks out there, so to speak. I hate to say that, but yeah. It is kind of the truth. Know your note seller, right? Yes. So oh, no, absolutely. Um, there's. A, I was on a call today with a uh, a company, um, you know, that provides some services, and we were just talking. He's like, you know, um, you know, who who is, uh, you know, who, who you've been buying from and stuff. And I, you know, mentioned the name and stuff, and he was laughing. He goes, looks at the last text on his phone. It was from that individual, um, and he knew him very well and stuff. But uh, you know, it, it just goes to show too. You know, know who your seller is, but also this is a very small business when it comes down to it. Um, you know, I think, you know, everybody kind of knows everybody in that perspective. For the most yeah, part. they do. Um, it is a small neighborhood, right? Yep. Uh, that Much more than regular real estate. No, absolutely. Oh, Jamie, any final thoughts? Um, Dave, I just want to thank you for coming on. This has been yeah. a blast and I uh, really no, appreciate my your time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was fun. Uh, Hopefully you get something out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Tons so, of nuggets buried in there for sure. And so one last thing, Dave, if people want to learn more information about your funds and what you've got going on, where, uh, how should they, uh, where they find, where they uh, find info easy. on PPR? Um, uh, PPR note co N O T E C O.com. You can find out more about our latest offerings. And um, obviously I'm always on bigger pockets and we do have a LinkedIn group called the stress mortgages group. And we answer questions literally, you know, almost every day, especially on bigger pockets. We answer a lot of questions. Uh, anybody has anything about notes, we typically jump on and chime in. You also have a, was it strategic investor Alliance? Is that right? Yeah. We, well, COVID's kind of put yeah. the squash on some of that. Gotcha. Um, but yes, we, we did have a group for high net worth investors. And to your point, um, that was something I did to add value to high net worth folks. So that's another idea that you could do. Mm -hmm. if you're trying to raise capital, form a group of, uh, that adds value to high net worth folks. You know? Well, thank you, Dave, again, for coming on this episode and everyone out there listening. Uh, thank you as always to listen to Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast and go out and do some good deeds.